overwhelming feeling of a forgiven sinner, Lord. And we're just so thankful for that because we know the feeling of that when we trust in you. So we just pray now, Lord, as we spend time in your word, that it's helpful for us and that it's glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're consider, continuing our study in the parables, and this week we're going to look at an account of a sinful woman who was forgiven by Jesus, but in that account there's actually going to be a brief two-line parable that Jesus talks about, that, uh, about two debtors that were forgiven. So we're going to start off in Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. It says this, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, Jesus accepts this invite to eat a meal at a Pharisee's home. Now, normally, when we hear Pharisee, what do we think? We think negative, right? We think, we automatically think negative of the person because, in general, the Pharisees gave Jesus the most issues and the most problems. The Pharisees were the ones that came out against Jesus. Jesus spoke out against the Pharisees. But Jesus accepted this invitation because it seemed as though this Pharisee was genuinely interested in what Jesus had to say. So Jesus, as it was custom at that, in that day, he reclined at the table. Now, they didn't use tables and chairs like we use these days. The, you know, when we go to a dinner, obviously, you got a nice table and chairs around the table. Part of the way the culture was, not many homes actually had chairs in their homes. And when you really think about it, it kind of makes sense. Because any of you that are a little handy out there, some of you guys that are a little handy out there, like, think about it. If you were, like, to build a table, you're like, I could build a table. And then you look at a chair, and you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. So maybe you can't build a chair. A lot of people didn't have that. Maybe a lot of it was a difficulty issue of building or just affordability of having that type of furniture in your house. So normally they had low tables in the homes, and people reclined at the table. And if you can only imagine, they would probably lean on one elbow and eat with the other hand. So another custom of that day was if you were invited to a meal with relig religious leaders, you would be at the main table. That, that is where Jesus was. He was actually reclining at the main table. But there would also be uninvited guests that reclined or stood against the walls of the room so they could observe and listen to the religious people's conversations. And this is how this next person ended up in the room. You know, when we think about this, and, and, and I know you were probably pretty surprised as I was last week when Ethan was here and he was just talking about cultures and like, you know, when, when he brought to life that parable, like I was saying to my kids, I was like, imagine if every time we had like a Bible study Study or something at the church, and uh, somebody walked in, they're like, hey, Jim's here. Everybody gets up, okay, and everybody sits down. Let's get started with the Bible study. Okay, Fred walks in. Hey, Fred's here. You know, I mean, how disruptive that would be, but then when you think about it, culturally speaking, like, it's pretty cool, right, that everybody kind of greeted each other. Well, this is kind of like the same thing. Now, here's this, like, VIP dinner, but these other people get to kind of come in and kind of observe and see what's going on. So this woman of the city, it says this. There we go. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining, he being Jesus, at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Now this woman showed up, basically what the scripture is saying, this woman showed up because she heard that Jesus was there. And she brought this flask of ointment as a gift. Now notice it says this woman who was a sinner, or she was a sinner. Now that can be said about all the people at the dinner, right? Except for Jesus. All the people in the room, all the people at the dinner, they were all sinners except for Jesus. But saying that she was a sinner was not like saying we are all sinners. Saying that she was a sinner tells us that this woman was actually known in the community as a very sinful woman. She actually had a reputation. She was known by her sin. Maybe it was addiction. Maybe it was theft. Maybe it was her sins of promiscuity. Whatever her sins were, it was known and it was very public and most if not all people, knew who she was. Now, think about this for a second. Think about how this woman must have felt 
in a social and public situation, having this type of reputation. She must have felt like everyone was looking at her. And the truth is, right, they were. They actually were. Whether it's right or wrong, they actually were. I remember years ago, I read about a public figure who fell into a sinful lifestyle, and he was annoyed because everywhere he went, he felt like everybody's looking at me. And the truth is, they probably were. You know, honestly, if you need some extra motivation not to sin, think about the public shame and embarrassment that you bring upon yourself, bring upon your family. Think about that for a second. So obviously, this woman was probably very emotional just even stepping into this situation. She was going into a social situation where everybody was like, hey, there's that sinful woman. There's her, known by her sinful deeds. So let's see what she does. Verse 38 says, And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her, the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, this seems kind of strange, right? It seems like a kind of strange picture. I mean, biblically speaking, when we read about this, we've heard about this, and we're like, oh, you know, what an act of gratitude here. This is amazing. But it seems a very strange thing to do. And in our culture, it would be kind of strange, wouldn't it, if this happened? It would be kind of strange. But in their culture and their customs, if someone came into your house, one of your servants or you would actually wash the dirt off their feet because of the dusty roads and the paths that they traveled. So this woman was doing what was normally, normally customary in one sense, but it was also an act of gratitude and love towards Jesus because she knew who Jesus was. When she heard who Je where Jesus was going to be, no matter what her reputation was, she said, I got to get there. So there she was, and she was seeking Jesus, and she found him. Now, let's see what happens. It says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So now we witness a Pharisee being a Pharisee, right? We witnessed it before it was like, okay, Jesus went to a Pharisee's house. Now we see, okay, this Pharisee is being a Pharisee. Before, he was curious about what Jesus had to say, but now the social norm was broken, and the known sinful, unclean woman was washing and kissing Jesus' feet. This was a problem for the Pharisee. This was a huge problem. Not only that, at this point, he was challenging who Jesus was, because at this point, people, many people were saying, he's a prophet, he's a prophet, he's a prophet. And so basically, he's saying, if Jesus is, at the very least, a prophet, Shouldn't he know who's actually touching his feet? This woman should not be touching his feet. She's unclean. She's a known sinner. She should have nothing to do with this situation here. And now she's barged in, got herself pretty much next to the VIP table, started crying, started wiping Jesus' feet, kissing Jesus' feet, and doing all this. So Jesus answers in verse 40. And Jesus, answer, Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Now I want to stop here. This is kind of like a little bit of a side note. Because before this, we didn't know this guy's name was Simon, did we? We didn't know his name was Simon. We just, Jesus went to a Pharisee's house. And think about this for a second. I like this part because Jesus calls this Pharisee by name. He says, Simon. You know what? There's a sense of Jesus knowing this man. Now he's no longer just a Pharisee in the account. Like, we have to do something with this now, right? Now he's not just this faceless Pharisee. He's Simon. He's a man named Simon. Now, this may have captured the attention of Simon, right? Wait, Jesus, he's calling me by name. He's not just saying you, because Jesus does that in some situations, right? He calls this Pharisee by name, uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, author of many books, said this, a person's name is to him or her the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Now think about this for a second. This is a side note, okay? Just moving away a little bit. Have you ever noticed how you feel when people remember your name? You ever notice the feeling of people remembering your name? 
You know, I don't want to make any of the, those of you that have a hard time with names feel bad because I'm kind of in that stage, <laughs> like maybe, I don't know if it's age or the amount of people, you know, that you know in life. But when someone remembers your name, it's an encouragement. When they say your name, you ever talk to somebody that says your name, they say your name like repeatedly, there's something about it. And I never really thought about it much till the last few years. And I'm like, you know, there's something about when somebody uses your name because it's so intimate and in, in your life, right? They're using your name. That's why when you call customer service, what do they say? Who am I speaking with? And you're like, who, why do you care? Like, right, you know? But they want to use your name, right? They want to use your name because a lot of times they want to sell you something, right? But here's the truth. There's something about using that name that makes it so personal. So now we went from this Pharisee to Simon. So Jesus says to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. So he gives a little short parable. It says a, a, per, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love more? Now let me ask you, what do you think, okay? What do you think? Of course, the one that owed more is going to love more because they're going to be they're they're going to be more thankful. They're going to be like, I can't believe this. I can't believe how much this person forgave me. I can't believe how much money they essentially gave me because they never made me pay this back. So what did Simon do? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. Okay, he was probably like, is this a trick question? Okay, what am I getting myself into here? Okay, and what did Jesus say? You have judged rightly, okay? You have judged rightly. Jesus is saying, see, you do actually understand that the person that has a lot to be forgiven will be much more appreciative. In fact, they will love the one that forgave them more than the other would. He's saying, you do understand this. Now, you understand why this woman is right here at my feet. Because all of you people know her as a sinner. And whether that's right or wrong, whether you're looking at her or not, or whether you're whispering about her, all of you people know her sins. Now, that's a, that's a pretty tough place to be in, right? Imagine if everybody knew your sins. So that's the seat this woman was sitting in. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. So Jesus basically, here's what he does. He compares. Okay, Simon. I came into your house, and you pretty much ignored all the customs. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't kiss me. Remember, uh, Ethan said last week, people came in, and they would kiss each other. He's like, I've kissed more men. Than, you know? And you know, basically, like that was the custom. So apparently, now Jesus is tracking back to the moment he walked in, and he's saying, listen, you didn't even do the customary things. Like, where's your gratitude for me even being in your house that you would do to somebody that would come in that was a VIP at any one of your dinners? You would do these things. You gave me no kiss. From the time I came in, she has not ceased kissing my feet. You did not anoint, anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. Was Jesus saying that Simon the Pharisee did not need to do those things because he was not a sinner? No. He was supposed to do those things because it was custom. So it seems to me that Jesus was saying to Simon, he didn't do those things because he was not yet, one, admitting his, he was a sinner, but he also wasn't recognizing Jesus as really the ultimate VIP. I mean, think about this for a second. He wasn't really recognizing Jesus for who he was. In Simon's eyes, Jesus was a religious teacher that may or not have been from God, so he treated Jesus just pretty much like any guy who walked in to his house. He did not see who Jesus really was, 
But the woman, on the other hand, when she found out Jesus was at Simon's house, she went there, and when she was in the presence of Jesus, the weight of her sin caused her to cry at his feet. Think about that. I don't think this woman traveled there to say, I'm going to cry at Jesus' feet and dry his feet off with my hair. I don't think she said that. I think she said, I want to go see Jesus. She knew she was a well-known sinner. She had the ointment. She wanted to give a gift. But I think the weight of her sin was so heavy that when she got to Jesus, she fell at his feet. Think about that for a second. Most of you know the famous evangelist, Billy Graham. He said this, the closer you get to Christ, the more sinful you are going to feel. Everyone that has seen a true reflection of God is deeply convicted of their own sin. Peter said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Do you remember that? The fact that you are aware of your sin and feel guilty about it is a sign of spiritual life. Think about that for a second. The fact that you're aware of your sin and feel guilty about it is a sign of spiritual life. Conviction of sin is actually a sign of life, spiritual life. This woman was filled with spiritual life, even though in the eyes of Simon the Pharisee and everybody else, she was a low life. She was filled with spiritual life, but in the eyes of all of them, she was a low life. They looked at her as second, third, fourth class citizen. So Jesus said, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Now there's a lot here, right? I like the way Jesus says it. He says her sins, what does he say? Which are many. It's like, I know what she's done. I'm Jesus, okay? I know what she's done. She has many sins. I know she has a reputation, and I know more than you guys even know. Her sins, which are many. Jesus is saying to Simon the Pharisee, I'm well aware what what she's been doing. And not only that, I know and I'm willing to forgive her of her sins. I'm willing to do that. Now, Jesus forgiving of her of her sins before a crowd of people, religious leaders, obviously is going to get them talking. And we see this in many other places, right? He says he can forgive sins. Okay, who's this guy? We got to get rid of him. It's basically what ended up happening. You know the rest, right? But then Jesus says, for she loved much. Now we all know this is not the full gospel preached yet, right? It's not the full gospel preached. Jesus didn't die on the cross yet. Mostly, right, because the whole plan did not take place, so it's not the full gospel yet. Then Jesus tells Simon why this woman was so thankful and did what she did. But he who is forgiven little loves little. So she realized how desperately she needed to be forgiven because her sins were so many. She realized it. This is why she's acting like this. The weight of her sin, she realizes, I'm a lowlife. Everybody knows me as a lowlife. I've made terrible choices in my life. I've done things that nobody should be doing. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed. She desperately needed to be forgiven. So this act of gratitude and love just pours right out of her. Well, the good news was for this woman, Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. What a moment this must have been for this woman to hear Jesus say those words. Do you remember the moment that you realized that Jesus was willing to forgive you of every sin you ever committed? Do you remember that moment? Do you remember that moment when you realized, I don't have to bear the weight of this anymore. I'm never going to have to pay for the things that I've done in my past. Do you remember that moment? I mean, I'm hoping it was an overwhelming moment for you. But could you imagine where this woman sat? To have Jesus look right at her and verbally say it to her, your sins are forgiven. This is why we as believers should be willing to listen and follow Jesus. This is why we love Jesus, because he's willing and able to forgive us. We don't do the right thing, 
because we're afraid. We do the right thing because we love Jesus and he was willing to forgive us, right? We do the right thing out of gratitude. We live in a way that's pleasing to God because he loved us. What? First. That's why we do that. Our obedience is, is a response to God. Okay? We don't do the right thing. And that's what we teach our kids all the time. You're not doing the right thing because mom and dad told you to. You're not doing the right thing because, you know, it looks good socially. You're doing the right thing because you're responding to the love that God has shed upon you. So now we get the chatter. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? So now all the VIPs that were at the table in Simon's house could not believe that Jesus told this woman her sins were forgiven. So Jesus answered their skepticism. Okay, they're chattering around. He answers their skepticism by telling the woman why her sins were forgiven. Now this is where we start to get into the gospel a little more here. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now we see the gospel taking shape a bit more, right? Her faith in the fact that Jesus could forgive sins is actually what saved her. Okay, her faith in Jesus. Obviously, Jesus saved her, but Jesus recognized her faith. So that's where we see the gospel starting to take shape, right? Because we know that Jesus died on the cross. We know that Jesus rose again. But just knowing that isn't enough, right? Just looking and reading and saying, yep, that's the Christian message. We, we know that, okay? That's not enough, okay? You need to put your faith in the fact that Jesus died for you. Because if you don't, you can't be saved. But not only that, if you don't, you will do works of righteousness for wrong motives, because then you'll think I'm working my way into heaven rather than Jesus bringing me there because I have faith in him. Sure, Jesus can forgive any sin he chooses, but he only forgives the sins of those that have faith. He only saves those that actually have faith. So today, excuse me, we observe communion. And that's for believers. Like the woman in the account, we come to the feet of Jesus and should be thankful that he is willing and able to forgive us. See, Jesus tells us when we're all together, we should remember that. Now, this is important. I think one of the reasons why Jesus wants us to collectively remember what he did for us is that he keeps us from looking at the sins of other people around us and pointing the finger at them like Simon the Pharisee did and all the others. See, we come together as a group of sinners. We're all in the same boat, aren't we? We all come together and we say, yep, we're all sinners. And Jesus died for us. We're all in this together. It doesn't matter what your sin is or was. Okay? We're all in the same boat. We are sinners in need of forgiveness. Sure, some of us realize that forgiveness to a greater extent because the sins were many, okay? And some of us realize that forgiveness to a lesser extent because our sins weren't as many. But guess what? We can all take a lesson from this woman and realize, you know what? Whether they're great or small, we all should love like this woman loved. So when we come together for communion, we have to remember that we were in the same boat. We were in the same boat. Sad to say, Simon the Pharisee is in the same boat as the woman too. His sins are great as well. He just doesn't realize it. So we as believers remember what Jesus has done for us. The second thing we do during communion is we take the sins that we're struggling with. Because we all realize this. We're going to struggle with sins as a believer. We're going to struggle. So we take those sins, throw them at the feet of Jesus. The sins that he already forgave, past, present, future, okay? We throw them at the feet of Jesus and ask him for help, ask him for deliverance. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a few brief moments of just silence to spend time confessing those sins, and then we'll observe communion together.
Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is the cup of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Bow with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful, Lord, that you have indeed forgiven us of our sins when we come to faith in you, when we trust in you. We pray that we learn some deep-rooted lessons from this woman and how she loved you so much because she realized how much you had forgiven her. But Lord, regardless of how many, how much, and how long the list of sins that we have are, Lord, we're called to love like this woman because we have been forgiven much. So I thank you for this day. I thank you for each person here. And I just pray, Lord, that we all are daily reminded of your forgiveness and the impact it has on our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.